Wait for it. Wait for it. Yeah, just another minute or so, folks, before we get started. Thanks for being here tonight. How was the traffic? Pretty good. Really? Good. Glad to hear it. I welcome. Good. Ooh, under the wire. Did it. Ooh, six on the dot. I think. All right, we get started. I don't even know if I need the mic like there. Yes. <laughs> okay. You're right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so my name is Sam Wins. I'm a science educator and conservation biologist here at the park. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you an incredible speaker and a dear friend. Um, this is the next in our Naturally Speaking series. We do these talks every couple of months or so to talk about the real science and the real resources that we have here at the park. So Keep in mind, there's more. If you like tonight's event, there are more to sign up for. They're all free. Um, but without further ado, Patricia, I first met Patricia a while back. Uh, she's a longtime uh, volunteer here at the Rio National Monument, runs the uh, Native Plant Greenhouse, um, and is a, what we call an iNaturalist power user. <laughs> what that means is she is an incredible community scientist. She has taken so many observations of the natural world that has contributed to real science and made some real discoveries, which she's actually gonna talk about some interesting discoveries uh, here tonight. Um, and now she's our vegetation technician. So without further ado, give a round of applause to Patricia Simpson. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. So. Real quick, I just want to let you know that I had a huge problem today. I woke up and I had a French accent. That's that not never that. happened to me. My English is usually <laughs> perfect, but um, I have tried all day to get rid of it and it's not working. So uh, if anything is mispronounced tonight, blame it on the French, all right? <laughs> So let's talk about my credentials tonight to uh, talk to you about citizen science. Um, who am I, or rather, who am I not? I am not an entomologist, and that's people that will study um, arthropods, including insects and spiders, scorpions, creepy crawly things, right? Um, I am not a trained um, entomologist, but I love insects and I, some people think sometimes that I am, but I'm not. Um, I am not a botanist. I am not a biologist of any kind. I work in plants all the time, but not a botanist. And I am not a trained or academic scientist of any kind. I've had no training in that. So who am I, really? I have a business degree from France. I have a theater degree from the US and I worked in a theater business. I worked in a nonprofit business and I became a mom. And when my son started going to school, I needed to keep busy. So I started volunteering in a lot of places. Uh, I, were, I volunteered at Project Twilight, doing wildlife rehabilitation. I also worked there for a while. Uh, Mission Trails Regional Park, amazing place to uh, volunteer and become a naturalist over there. Um, and of course, Discovery National Monument, my favorite place of all, right? And your favorite place too, right? Woo. Woo. <laughs> and just last year, I started uh, working here um, as a vegetation technician, as Sam mentioned, uh, running the greenhouse. I was doing that as a volunteer before, uh, but I actually started working here officially, so that's great. Um, so we're gonna talk about citizen science tonight. It's a hot, hot topic, but what is it really? Let's define it, okay? The Oxford Dictionary definition says that the, it's the collection and analysis of data related relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically 
as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. That's a lot of words right there. I like to actually simplify that. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. I, my own definition is just people observing and reporting natural events or organisms they see or hear, right? So we're going to talk a lot about these two words right there, observing and reporting. So on this side of the room, when I point to you, I, you, I want you guys to say observing. That's right. right. Observing. Oh, nice. Some <laughs> this side of the room, when I say reporting, or when I point to you, you say reporting. Reporting. Yes. For those of you who are at home, if your last name is from A to L, you say observing when I'm pointing to this side. And when I'm pointing to that side, you say from L to Z, you say report. Okay? That's a fun game. <laughs> All right. So what's the buzz about citizen science, citizen science, right? Everybody is talking about it. We have lots of websites that have lots of information on citizen science. You have books that are being written about citizen science. You have association that put on conferences about citizen science. It is everywhere. There are even TED Talks about citizen science. So you know it's a hot topic when it's on that stage, right? So there's articles, there's research being done about it, there are uh, papers that are being published about it. If it is such a hot topic right now, is it something new? Are we looking at a new thing, a new trend, right? Well, not so much. If you look in the past, um, these are some naturalists. These were these people were citizen scientists. They actually did not go to school to do the things that they discovered. They just practiced citizen science to become scientists themselves, right? So that's something that we can aspire. Be the next Darwin, right? <laughs> Be the next Audubon. Charles Darwin actually came in right at the time when science was starting to be accepted in some academic places. Um, he actually had a training uh, in medical school. He hated it, was not interested in that, but he really wanted to be a naturalist. But when he was in uh, this environment, in these academic environments, he actually met a lot of people that were also naturalists and interested in science. And these people became his mentors, so he learned a lot from them. So it was a little bit of schooling there for him. Um, you take Audubon, a completely different story. He had basic schooling, learned to read and write. He was shipped to the United States by his father to work in the mining business. He had little interest in that, of course. Thank you. That's great for us, right? <laughs> um, and he became obsessed with documenting birds. So what was he doing? He was observing. Observing. Oh, we're a little quiet there. <laughs> Let's try this again. He was observing. All right. And um, through his illustration, what was he really doing? Yeah, he was practicing citizen science right there. And we all learned from what he was doing, right? Uh, incredible contribution to the world of science. Some people did not have access to science circles or scientific societies as they call them. There were no science really in school, but at least if you were a man, you could at least get into um, scientific society and discuss your findings with others. For women, it was a little different. Uh, Mary Eddings was an incredible paleontologist. She's actually the mother of paleontology. Um, she came from England, and where she was, there were a lot of fossils. And um, she made a living, very poor living actually, selling fossils to um, tourists there. But she also excavated different fossils that made incredible contributions to museum <laughs> collections. Um, clients, she had other clients that re were really after bigger fossils and, and bigger things, uh, unique things. 
and she knew how to identify everything. She uh, unfortunately was never published, uh, except for I think one letter that she wrote to a scientific journal, um, criticizing some of their findings. But other than that, she was never published. Um, and this is how hard it was for women at the time to be a scientist. Now I need a volunteer. How about you, sir? Yes, you come and read this book. Oh, that volunteer. <laughs> I never leave home with that. <laughs> All right. So, it is certainly a wonderful instance of divine favor that this poor, ignorant girl should be so blessed. For by reading and application, she has arrived to that degree of knowledge as to be in the habit of writing and talking with professors and other clever men on the subject. And they all acknowledged that she understands more of the science than anyone else in the kingdom. Thank you, dear sir, for acknowledging that she was the smartest person in the room. Ever so reluctantly, <laughs> this poor ignorant girl, right? Um, so yes, she had to work extra hard to convince the societies, those, those scientific societies to accept her knowledge, really. Um, another one of my favorite, or she's my favorite, really, Mary Sibylla Marion. She was actually from Germany. Um, she's one of my heroes. Anybody who can sport a bonnet like that and still look good. <laughs> Honestly, that's that's like hero material right there, right? Uh, she was trained as an illustrator. She worked in a print shop, but she had a passion for insects and creepy crawlies for entomology, basically. And she contributed amazing things to the world of science and what we know about insects today. Before her work, people thought that insects, they were not sure where insects were coming from. They thought they were actually born from dirt. But they just appeared, you know, from dirt. And there you get your insects. She actually was able to talk and, and illustrate the life cycle of moths and butterflies. They lay eggs. No, they're not born from dirt. <laughs> they make they make eggs. They have the whole metamorphosis process. She was the one who documented that first. And she was able to do a lot of... <laughs> and with her, with her illustration, she was... Recording. Yes, guys. I like that. She's German. German, yes. Um. <clears throat> There are other versions, there's a lot more out there. I'm just going to uh, cover one more, but a lot more, so many more uh, contributors to science, um, a lot more marginal groups, uh, people of color, for example. I just wanted to point out that um, Benjamin Banneker is the person you need to thank for the tide charts that you're consulting when you're going down to the tide pools. He had very little schooling. He had went to Quaker school. And um, and from there, learned to write and read and pretty much self-talk himself. That's he was self-talk. <laughs> uh, uh, he was self-talk in mathematics and in um, um, science of space. Help me out. Psychology. Astronomy. Thank you, astronomy. <laughs> I just left that word for a second. All right, in astronomy. Then from there, he put uh, in almanacs, he created almanacs so people would know um, what the tides were like every day. Pretty incredible. So all these people, they had something in common, right? They really, they had insatiable curiosity about the world for sure. But is there something else there? that they were expressing when they were doing their work. Is citizen science possibly a survival instinct, right? So if we go back in time, 
Rebecca, the village in prehistoric time, when you get your village, you get your hunters on one side. They are specialists in what they're doing. They're uh, scientists in the arts of hunting, if you will, right? And then you have on the other side, the um, uh, uh, gatherers, they're, they're in their specialists as well. So they're scientists in their field. They don't know much about hunting, a little bit, but not as much as the hunters. So you get the hunters over there that are gonna be going in the woods and they're gonna find a patch of cherry trees that they don't think the tribe knows about, all right? Then on this other side, you're gonna have the gatherers, they're gonna be collecting some fruits that they know about and they're gonna see a herd of deer over there, right? It is becoming a matter of survival for them to pass that information. So they're gonna be, Observing, <laughs> they're going to be observing and they're going to be as a matter of survival. This is going to be the feedback loop that's going to need to happen. Observing and reporting what you've seen or heard is a matter of survival. Are you with me? Do you remember this? Child, the people that have, that grew up in the seventies and the eighties, who remember that when your your neighbors went to a place far away and they took photos and they came back and you had to go to their house in their living room and after dinner you had to go through the slideshow <laughs> and try not to fall asleep, right? I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> well. They were being just good citizen scientists. They were just reporting what they see, that, what they saw, and what they heard overseas, just in case you needed that information for survival, right? That's what they were doing. We're doing this today on steroid with social media. People are reporting what they're eating everywhere. They're reporting what they're harvesting. They're reporting where they're eating. They're reporting everything you want to know, right? Because you might need that information and we consume that information. We just go through and it's like, oh, oh, this person went to that restaurant. I wonder what it's like. You know, we, we, um, we're adapted to consume that information. And it's not only about food. We do that about human behavior. We do that about wildlife that we've encountered. We post that very readily. So we're very adapted to share all this information and consume all that information. We do that on a daily, right? So how does that help scientists out there? You have the process of a scientist who's collecting data in the field. They're often by themselves, they have a limited amount of time to collect data, uh, after which they need to go back into the lab and do the analysis, after which they write a very fancy report. And if they're lucky, only if they're lucky, they will be published in a scientific journal, and that's the end of their career. No, it's just the beginning. <laughs> um, so very little of that process is actually spent in the field, right? Collecting that data. So they're basing their research on a limited, limited amount of data. So imagine a scientist who's going in the field, like this is the shores of um, Lake Henshaw right there. So that person is out there and is trying to document the biodiversity of the shores of Lake Henshaw. The biodiversity is the amount of species you may have in a certain geographical area that encompasses everything, birds, the plants, the fish, what, you know, fungus, lichen, whatever else. Um, they're gonna have a limited amount of time to collect their data, it takes three months, you know, and after that they're gonna have to go back into the lab and put everything together, figure out what they have. But imagine you have people out there that go there all the time. This is a public area. And um, you have locals, for example, that are going to be visiting it possibly even every day. You have other people that are tourists that will stop by once in a while. And these people may have cameras. They may take pictures of things, right? You are going to have other people that have different perspectives and different interests that are going to possibly take photos of things, you know? A child will look at very different things than adults will. You have people that will go there at sunset, you know, very different times of day uh, or sunrise, right? That's outside of what the scientists can do. They're only working a certain amount of hours during the day, and that's that, right? They can't spend their whole time in the field. 
And then you have people that have different times of this, different seasons. Um, more people that come the next week, and more, and more, and still more. So these are all the people that are going to be visiting that site and possibly taking pictures of things during that three months period that that, that a scientist is looking at. And maybe that scientist can actually look beyond those three months. If all these people are and imagine what that does to their data pool. It just boosted it up big time, right? So that's what a scientist did, and that's why we're here today. What can you do? How do you participate in this process? Well, that's very easy. The first step is to go explore and have fun. When I say explore, even though there's a little rocket right there, I don't mean go to the moon. You don't need to go to the moon. You don't go, need to go river rafting anywhere. You can actually go just into your backyard and observe there. Um, great discoveries have been made in backyards. We'll talk about that. When you are observing after that, um, you're going to be observing what you're seeing, and then you're going to be reporting what you're seeing. You're going to be learning. You're going to have feedback. If you're posting it once you report it, you're going to get feedback from the community about what you've posted. Maybe you posted a picture of a fly and you're not sure what it is. Times they're going to be looking at it and say, oh, I know what that is. Uh, we recently <laughs> took a picture of a fly or a rare rubber fly in the visitor center and somebody was just, yeah, we know what that is. So that was a great thing. Um, and then the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know and you're going to want to repeat. And that's fine. That's really an activity that you can indulge in. It's really fun, right? So the tools that you have at your disposal to start doing this process, um, you can go to websites such as uh, citizenscience.gov. That's a great website. It has all the projects from all of these um, federal agencies right there, including National Park Services. But if you're not into um, bugs or birds or something else, if you are, let's say, into astronomy, you can go check out NASA projects from there. They have projects in there that you can participate in. If you're into weather events, NOAA has projects in there that you can participate in. So it's a great site to visit. Um, you have other sites such as eBirds that specialize into a certain category of things. eBirds, like obviously just for birds, you don't even need to have a camera, you just go out there. You catalog the species that you see and how many birds of this species you've seen in a given amount of time, and you just publish that list. Um, this is a pioneer site that started in 2002, and it was one of the earliest sites to do that, to collect data from people. Um, so pioneer in citizen science. Bugguide.net, same thing as eBird, started the following year in 2003. Same thing but with cookie crawling things. Calflora for California plants. And then you have other specialty sites such as the Nature's Notebook who specialize in the phenology of things. What is the phenology? That is the seasonality of things. So they're interested in knowing when plants are in bloom. When do they go to seed? When are birds mating? When are they nesting? When are the kids fledging? Does that change from year to year, right? So that's what um, the Nature's Notebook focuses on, the cycle of things. And then my personal favorite, and I know some of you guys' person, personal favorite as well, iNaturalist. That is a great site. It is simple to use. Um, it's um, great. It also feeds the data that's in iNaturalist a lot of the time feeds into other projects such as Calflora will actually um, put iNaturalist observations on their site as well as the, the observations they already have on there. And uh, a lot of the federal agencies that have projects actually use iNaturalist, including National Park Services. We do have some projects I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, uh, afterwards projects that we have here at uh, the park that involve iNaturalist. So how does iNaturalist help scientists out there? I just want to give you a few examples 
of things that have been discovered out there that really has helped science. You may think everything's been discovered out there. I am not going to find anything, but wait for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> forgot to say. This is how simple iNatural is. This. You can download an app on your phone and just work from there, or you can download, you can work from your computer. If you have a fancy camera, you download the pictures onto your computer and you can just um, do the observations directly on your browser. Um, take a photo, record sound, post it, and then scientists and the community will get back to you and tell you what you see, what you heard. So a few examples. Um, this one is in Los Angeles, so close by, right? This person was in, a, I think it was a schoolyard, and took a picture of this little tiny insect on a flower and thought, you know, didn't know what it was. Somebody out there said, oh, I think that's a wasp. So they said, you know, maybe that's a wasp. And John Asher, who is the world specialist in these, came in and said, wait a minute, this is a yellow colored nest bee. And how is that extraordinary, right? This was the first North American record of this bee. It is actually a bee from Australia. What is it doing in Los Angeles? That's something that scientists want to know when there's a new species that's arriving. They want to know when and where they are so that they can possibly control it. We don't know what the impact of what this bee is going to have on our native bees, and so it's important to have that knowledge. Um, since then, since that observation, which was in 2019, there's actually been nine more observations of this bee, all in LA. So we know that this bee is in the Los Angeles area. We haven't seen it yet. Outside of that, there's a lot of people looking at bees in San Diego County. <laughs> Some of them are here. Um, and we haven't found it yet. So that's that's good news for us in San Diego, but we know that it's right up, um, up north and there could be a problem in the future. Um, you may think that everything's been discovered out there and you know there's nothing to find that's, that is new, completely new. Well, I'll think again. Um, this is an attic, um, also known as his real name is BJ Stacy. He unfortunately left us um, earlier this year, and we all miss him terribly. Incredible naturalist, so many contributions that he's made. Um, you can see the number under his name right there, 105,000. That's the amount of observation that he's put into by naturalists. But you can imagine that's an enormous amount, right? So many contributions. Um, this was at Mount Palomar, so we're getting closer to home, right? And he was visiting with a couple of friends there and took a picture of this little millipede-like thing, you know, not knowing exactly what it was. I think his initial, I, initial ID was just millipede. And um, we see Dr. P.C. Richard um, actually looked at it and said, oh, I think this is this species. And then he came back and said, no, it's not. Maybe it's something else. Well, this whole process lasted four years of trying to figure out what it was, only to find out that it was a brand new species that they had to describe. Scientists had to collect and do the whole uh, research project to figure out that these have never been seen before. And so far we can only find out about this thing that we can only find it at Mount Palomar until you guys go out there and start looking at melodies <laughs> and maybe we're going to find it somewhere else. That's why we're here tonight, right? You guys can put your Explorer hats on and go find melodies out there. So what I love about this story too is that because he was the first person to actually photograph this melody, that species was named after him. His name is B.J. Stacy. So, Amplaria stacii is the name of that millipede now. Pretty cool, right? So, if you want a species to be named after you, you know what to do, right? <laughs> All right. So, he was an accomplished naturalist, 
but there are people out there that are just, you know, taking pictures of things in their backyards, right? We're very close by right now. We're in Port Loma. And Bonnie is somebody who lives here in Point Loma and planted a lot of native plants in her backyard. And she started seeing a lot of new insects that she had never seen before. And she became very interested. She took pictures of them and with her cell phone. And she didn't know what they were really, and she didn't know what to do about all these pictures she was taking. So she started putting them on my naturalist. So she took a picture of this little fly right there on wishbone bush. And it took about a year for Spencer Pote, who is a specialist in and scientist specializing in fruit flies, to actually figure out what this was. He had to go to literature and descriptions in the literature about this fly because there were actually no photos of it. Um, this is a rare fruit fly that you find only in San Diego County. It's never been found anywhere else. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that name. Have fun. <laughs> this is the first photograph of a live specimen. So Spencer asked um, Bonnie to actually post on that other site, bugguy.net, as a reference because nobody had a photo of this fly, right? So now we have photos of this fly and we also know what plants it likes to visit because she was able to take more pictures in her yard of different plants that it visited. So a wealth of information just from her exploring things in her own backyard. This is right here in Port Loma, so you don't need to go very far, right? I have discovered species in this park that I didn't know were here. It's incredible. Very recently, very recently, here at the Pine Pools, we have one of our staff, she's over there, Carmen. She is an incredible photographer. She's got a big camera and everything that she likes to use. When she was over there, she didn't have her camera. She just had her binoculars and her cell phone. And a member of the public said, oh, there's a very cute bird over there. There's a little cheek, it's very cute. And she thought, okay, I'm gonna take a picture of the little cute bird, right? So she did. She took pictures of the family. That's a black oyster catcher over there. On the right side, it's actually a hybrid oyster catcher, a black oyster catcher uh, crossed with American oyster catcher. These are a little more rare to see out there, the hybrid birds. And what's even more rare is to, is to see that little chick right there. Now, Carmen didn't know at the time, but this was the first confirmed record of oyster catchers ever nesting or ever breeding within the San Diego County area. The birding community went nuts. <laughs> Woo! All because she she was reporting it. Yes. She could have, you know, put that on her Facebook and said, oh you're a cute chick and everything. But because she posted it on my naturalist, it was out there. She now has the first record for that. <laughs> Um, right here at the Rio National Monument still, um, we had a bio blitz in 2020 uh, that a lot of people participated in. Um, this was a bio blitz is an event that is within a time frame. It can be a month, it can be a week, it can be just a few days, it can be 24 hours. It's just it has a it has a limited time. It can look at a range of things or it can look at very precise things. This one was a, excuse me, a bio blitz for pollinators. We were interested in seeing what pollinators can we find in the month of September 2020 and what plants are they on. So we collected all the information on nine naturalists that were within the park within that time frame. So I went out there with my camera at the time I was a volunteer, went out there with my camera and tried to take pictures of all the insects and everything that I saw on the plants. And I saw this bee right there, and I wasn't sure what it was. I think it was the first words that came out of my mouth when I came back home and saw my husband. I, I said, I saw a bee, and I have no idea what it is. And I eagerly contacted James Hong, which is the specialist in bees in San Diego County. He has cataloged over 700 species of native bees right here within our county. That's an enormous amount, so he knows all the bees here, right? 
And he saw this and he's like, I don't know what it is. So he actually contacted Michael Orr, who's a specialist as well in um years. Michael Orr, who is a specialist in anthropology in uh, digger bees. Um he's actually in China. <laughs> Michael Orr said, Oh, I know exactly what that is. That is Anthophora urbana clementina. It's a subspecies of an urbane digger bee that we have one in the mainland, but there's a subspecies that's on San Clemente Island only. So this was the first record of an island endemic bee species on mainland. Now keep in mind that San Clemente Island is about 100 miles offshore from here. That's a long ways from home right there, right? So we needed to figure out whether it was a single bee that was here, whether we had a population. So all of a sudden the hunt was on and um, I was able to photograph that bee a couple more times. And then I actually contacted other users on my naturalist. They're now here. Mm -hmm. um, and said, hey, would you come and help me find this bee or see if you can see it as well? And Cindy Pensek and um, Tom Barnes um, both went out there and were able to photograph that bee as well, which was great. That was confirmation that we had that bee. We later were able to find out that we had several of them, so we have a population at the park. We have not seen it since then, but we have not seen the mainland species either. So maybe they're in stasis, which means they're being dormant because we've had two years of droughts in a row and there's not that many plants. So maybe they're not coming out. So we we keep surveying the areas to see if we can find more of these bees. We're hoping for rain. So keep your fingers crossed for more rain. Uh, maybe some year we're gonna have a, a, a better year and we're gonna have more plants and the bees are gonna uh, emerge from wherever they're staying at. Um, if you're wondering what our bee, our local bee looks like and how we know it's different, this is the urban, this is our mainland species. Same bee, different subspecies, right? It's very monochromatic, there's no red at all. So it's very easily distinguished from that red bee, right? Um, another thing that's very fun to do in a naturalist is actually see what's everywhere else in the world, right? Extraordinary things sometimes. In somebody's backyard in Mexico, in the village of Yalapa, somebody took a picture of this, right? What is this? No, no. What does it look like? A snake, snake right? It's like a snake, right? So different angle of that is right here. Whoa, wow. that's a weird looking snake, right? Wow. What's up with that? <laughs> what do you think that is? A slug? Anybody else guess? Yeah. A chrysalis? A cupa, yeah. This is actually the chrysalis of a butterfly. This is the pupa of a butterfly called the Daring Owl Butterfly. I have no idea these things existed in the world. My mind was just blown. I think some of my brain flew out of my ears and stuck <laughs> started on the wall, you know? It was just a mind-blowing experience to see this observation right there. Um, have you ever been in the woods and you're singing to yourself, talking to yourself, and you feel like the trees are listening to you, right? No, nobody? <laughs> well, if you're, if you're in Australia, <laughs> if you're in Australia, maybe you've got reasons to actually be paranoid about the trees listening to you, <laughs> right? This is a fungus that grows on trees. <laughs> They're just not the free thing. Again, brain splattered on the walls on that one as well. Um, it's just incredible. It just yeah. looks like a human figure. It's just incredible. So that's things to see on that natural around the world, but you can also see very cool things just close by. One of my favorite observations is this one. Um, not exceptional in the sense that this is something that people have seen before. This is an alligator lizard and it's tripe racer that's trying to eat it. And it is documented that alligator lizards will bite their tail to try to defend themselves. It's a lot harder for that 
snake all of a sudden to swallow a loop as opposed to a lizard, right? So even though this was something that was already known, there were some herpetologists, people that studied reptiles and amphibians for a living, that know about this behavior, but that's, they have never seen it, right? So they were interesting, really interested in knowing exactly what happened there. And they started asking a lot of questions. When did it start? You know, how did the snake approach the lizard? The, um, how long did this interaction last? Who won? So show of hands, who thinks here the snake got its meal? <laughs> oh! Oh, we have one team snake. We have one team snake. Team lizard. Okay, I'm pretty sure. Yes, we do like an underdog, right? <laughs> team lizard wins, of course. Yeah, the lizard actually it lasted about twenty minutes. Twenty minutes, and the snake actually at least twenty minutes because the person actually came in and that already started and started taking pictures. But it lasted twenty minutes at the end of it. The snake said, I cannot swallow these things. I have other things to do today. Gotta get going and left. And um, the lizard probably ended up with a few puncture wounds in his skull, but otherwise fine. Just move it away. Oh, going back the wrong way. Um, there's also the cute things. This is right here at home too. This is near Mission Trails, Regional Park. There's always some fun things to see. Uh, with the people that live around Mission Trails, this little gray fox on the wall sleeping like this. Oh, they steal my heart. Um, little ravens are building each other and feeding each other, things like this. Little bees are sleeping on a flower. So now sometimes you see behaviors like this. This was um, not so early in the morning, but it was actually a cold morning, and these bees were just comatose. They just were not going to go anywhere. Um, and this is actually a thing that bees do. They sometimes sleep in groups like that on vegetation. And the nice thing about iNaturalist is that there's some people that are interested in some of these behaviors. So they will actually start projects about it. And that's a wonderful way to actually look at, project, at, at uh, things on iNaturalist, browse through a project. So you have something like sneaky bee slumber parties <laughs> project on iNaturalist. So if you ever see that out there, you know, you can actually choose to put your observation in that project. Maybe somebody else is, is gonna, if you don't know about that project, somebody else is gonna see your observation and say, oh, that belongs to that project. And they're gonna be adding it to the project. So that's more data for the scientists to know which species are actually behaving this way. <laughs> so this is the project. I, also, I want now to talk to you about projects that we have right here in the park, right? We have one project that has to do with bees um, to study the bee phenology of uh, the phenology of bees and the plants that they um, visit on the Bayside Trail. So this particular project is not on a natural, it's on nature notebook, but you can actually go on Nature's Notebook website and create an account, find that project and sign up for it and participate that way. Highly recommend it. Um, we, on iNaturalist, we also have, there's also several projects. There's a project that happens um, every year in San Diego called the City Nature Challenge. That's the one on the top right there. The City Nature Challenge is always the last four days of April. And it happens all over the world. And of course, there's one San Diego City um, Nature Challenge uh, for the whole county of San Diego. And here at the park, we're doing, during that time, we're doing a 24-hour bio blitz. So next year, the City Nature Challenge is happening April 28th to May 1st. So our projects here in the park for 2023, our 24-hour bio blitz during that time, is going to be April 28th to April 29th. This is how it works. Um, from 5 p.m. on Friday to 5 p.m. on Saturday, um, there's going to be training sessions, education tables, so you guys can learn. There's a terrestrial arthropods um, team. You can see some of them right here that are um, 
studying and taking photos of insects that are being attracted to a sheet with a black light. Insects are naturally at night um, attracted by black light. So we saw a lot of different insects. That was a lot of fun. Uh, long hours at night, but it was well worth it to be in a park at night. Oh, yeah. Um, we had a bat team. We had a small mammal team. We had an intertidal team. We actually went into the tide pools like at 3.30 a.m. Oh, yeah, that's a fun. There's also another team that went during the day. Um, we had a bird team, a, a snake, and a lizard's team, and a plant team. We collected over a thousand observations within 24 hours, over a thousand. We, we recorded over 334 species. These are the species that we were able to identify. There were 56 people that participated, and we had almost 200 scientists from all over the world that actually chimed in to tell us what we were seeing. It's great, that's great data from the park. When we do that every year, year after year, we can actually get a picture of how things are evolving. And this is extremely useful for studying the park and science in the park, right? You can also simply volunteer in the park if you like. Um, there's other, this is a, a series of links, you know, if you want to, if you guys want to uh, take a picture of this, you can. Um, those things that I've talked about. At the bottom right there is the web, our website to get involved as a volunteer. It's a great way to participate in activities that we do. We do um, urban to fauna surveys where we check tracks. We have people that uh, go birding in the park all the time. We have um, different groups that do different things here in the park. Um, and so it's a great way to participate is to just get involved as a volunteer. You get in for free. When you're a volunteer, whoop, whoop, right? Um, and at the bottom right there, that's the email of our volunteer coordinator. So if you um, want to have questions about the different things that we have or how you can get involved with the park, that's a great place to go. Thank you so much for being here tonight and listening to me double, double, double. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the um, Cabernet National Monument Foundation for having me speak here tonight. That was a great honor to be here. Um, I have no idea how I'm doing on time. I feel like I zoomed through, but you're good. <laughs> good, good. So if you have any questions, and if you want to talk about the next um, iNatural, uh, not iNatural, naturally speaking, event right there. Thank you. <laughs> That makes me even more excited about science if you know me at all. I'm already really in science. So thank you so much for that, Patricia. And we'll answer all your questions here in just a minute. Uh, but first, shameless plug for the things coming up. Um, we do, we will have another naturally speaking. We just don't have it scheduled yet, but it's probably about a month and a half out. Just keep tabs on our website. We'll post it as soon as we have information on that. Um, but there is something I did want to mention, and that is our junior scientist days, which is coming up at the end of September. September 23rd and 24th. And this is a way to engage the whole family in science. We're gonna have a STEM fair with scientists from across the county, here at Peter and London, as well as some science talks and walks. After the birding 101, there's gonna be all kinds of fun activities. So something to think about. Um, the 23rd is a Friday, the 24th is a Saturday, and it also happens to be a free for you. So um, you can bring everybody you can get in for free Monday. Um, what we're going to do next is um, we do have some folks on Zoom, so we'll take a couple questions from the audience here in person, if you have any, and then we'll take a couple from Zoom. We'll just kind of go back and forth um, until we're done and ready to go for our walk. Now, one bit of sad news, mom won't sad from home, um, <laughs> is that uh, we, we said this, this was going to end at 8 o'clock, but actually the park closes at 7.30 tonight at sunset, so we don't want you wandering around in the dark and hungry or something. All right, so we will have time for a walk. It'll just be more of an abbreviated walk. All right, um, so with that, any questions? Any questions for Patricia tonight? Thoughts or comments? Did you find you discovered? Yes, go for it. Uh, you mentioned that you were a, a 
what's I, I can't remember what you said your your role in this field you're working in part now you're a vegetation technician. So what is a vegetation technician? What is a vegetation <laughs> technician? So I actually uh take care of propagation of our native plants. So I run our nursery. Uh we do everything from seed collection to growing the plants to a certain size so we can put them back into the park and we actually go out there, we dig, and we put our plants in place, and we water them, we monitor how they're doing. From A to Z, we do everything. Yes. I also help a little bit with um, invasive plant management. Uh, I have a colleague here that does that. That's her specialty, but when I have time, I help her out a little bit. And how long did you volunteer doing that? I, oh, I started volunteering here in 2014, and all my volunteering at first was animal related in some ways. I was at the time with Project Wildlife, you know, so I was very interested in animal behavior and things like that. So I started volunteering with um, Herbert Office Service, and that's um, going to visit uh, tracks that we have in the park. Um, this study has been going on for years. Um, have you know how many years? How many years? Since 1995. Since 1995. There you go. The marine biologist knows. <laughs> if you don't know about something, ask the marine biologist, right? Um, 1995, so we've been, every month we go for a week and we check those traps and uh, we monitor the lizards and snakes that are in the park and some insects that can also fall in there. Uh, so I started doing that. I did uh, peregrine falcon surveys. I did shorebird surveys. It was all animal related. But when I was doing the reptile surveys, um, the botanist sometimes would come along and I would always ask him about the plants. And he said, oh, you know, you really start, you should try, you know, volunteering at the greenhouse. You know, you start to know your plants and everything. And I thought, no, no, I have no time for that. I didn't have any time for that. But I met myself, you know, like, okay, why not? So I started doing it a little bit and uh, really got into it. And then the person who was managing, the volunteer was managing the greenhouse at the time, found a job and left. So I took over. Uh, I knew not a whole lot about plant propagation, but I learned a lot <laughs> on the go. I did learn a lot from her, from my predecessor. Uh, but I worked with her for a few months, you know, and then after that, um, to her work. And uh, we have crews of volunteers that are coming and helping out the only difference. Yeah. That's my journey here at Rio. Any other questions from the audience? All right. Yes, go ahead, Brad. What is your process for getting involved with academics? Was it purely through iNaturalist or like how do you forge connections? Well, interestingly enough, Patricia, could you hold on a second? I'm going to repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was um, so that the folks at home can hear. Okay. So the question was um, what is your process for getting involved with academics? How did you forge those relationships? So my first the first time that I started getting involved, uh, it was with Jake's fund, which, you know, he's in two meetings in San Diego County. He actually gave a talk here in this room, naturally speaking event, um, about the native piece of San Diego County. And at the time, I was already getting into a naturalist and posting a lot of things, and I was itching to create a project in a naturalist, something I wanted to get into. And I went to see him at the end of the lecture and I said, hey, do you look at iNaturalist? Do you do anything with iNaturalist? And he's like, oh, I'd love to have the time to do that, but I do so many other things, you know. And, and uh, right there and then I said, hey, I can start a project. Can you help out in identifying the bees and exchange you know, and everything? And then we can post some things in this project. So we actually started a project together on a natural list called uh, Visa San Diego County. And uh, we're still collaborating on that. We still have that project going. And of course, now that um, I found that other bee at Cabrillo, or the tech pools, um, he was very interested into that. And they, him and Michael Orr in China, John Asher in Singapore, wanted to write a paper about this new discovery. So I actually collaborated with them. It's 
for me, it's more of a matter of being a fly on the wall with really incredible people. Um, I have to laugh when I get, you know, emails back from uh, journals saying, you know, hey, doc, dear Dr. Simpson. <laughs> I'm like, no, they got me all wrong, you know, but they're all PhDs, you know, except for me, citizen scientists. <laughs> so uh, it's an incredible process to actually be you know, a fly on the wall and, and see what the, they're just, where the, you know, the, the way they're uh, analyzing all this data. Um, and you never know, you may get involved into, into something like that as well. We have James Hunt's predecessor right there. <laughs> this is just yours. She's becoming the next the expert right here in San Diego. Um, do you have a favorite plant animal relationship? Is it oh, bees that's or a question? Do I have a favorite plant animal relationship? Oh, oh. I hate those questions when I know. I'm a Pisces. I don't like. Um, uh, possibly my favorites is would be the Yakima and the Yakima. Um, that is such an incredible symbiotic relationship right there. Uh, when you know the first time I learned that that moth actually um, does not feed on anything. But it knows somehow, it, you know, the, 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 for that moth, the yakka moth, all the feeding happens at the caterpillar level. The caterpillar will eat, 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 eat. When it becomes an adult, it will pupate, becomes an adult. The only role for these adults, they don't have proboscis, they can't feed. They don't have mouth parts, they can't mm -hmm. feed. They, their only purpose is to mate and part mate. Somehow they know, without having to feed, they know to go to, the uh, male flower pick up some pollen, go to the female flower, drop off the pollen, lay eggs in the female flower so that the larva can feed on the seeds, on some of the seeds when the seed pods form. They will feed on all the seeds. There will be some seeds left for the plants to procreate. But that's what the yakas are relying on that, that yakamoth to do this process. And that just blows my mind. Um, to know that there's a moth that knows to do that. It doesn't go there for feeding. It's not accidental pollination. It is on purpose because it's a matter of survival. Thank you. So we have one question from Zoom. Yes. Patricia, with all of these recorded observations at Rio and elsewhere in the county through our naturalist, has there been much assessment on the state of our biodiversity with the pressures of the continuing drought and climate change? Um, so I am not a scientist, so I am not, you know, I, I can't really speak officially, but I certainly see a big difference in the amount of plants that we have in bloom, for example, in a year like this year compared to three years ago. It's a drastic difference. We were, really, you know, we had three years ago. We didn't have a great rainy season. We had a average, barely average, almost, you know, a little below average. Um, but it seemed like we got a lot of rain because we're so used to having dry years nowadays. Um, but there were a lot of plants that took this opportunity to just explode, right? And the last couple of years, it's been very, very quiet. So you, you see a difference. You see far less insects that are out there um, and less plants that are in bloom. So, so for rain. So after a long day of reporting on observation, what is your process of getting up on behind that and talking about it? So after so, long days of being out there in the field and taking photos, what is the process to go on INAT? So a lot of the uh, observations that I make are of insects. So I actually have a, a camera with a micro lens. That's what I like to do. Um, so I use the computer mostly. Um, I will snap pictures of plants very easily with my phone. Um, sometimes I'm out in the field, you know, pulling plants here and I see a bug and I don't have my camera with me, I just use my phone. So from the phone, it's very easy. You just, you know, 
post that on a natural list and your phone will know where you were. So it's super easy. It's a little more of a process when you do things on the computer, you have to go home, um, especially taking pictures of insects. Um, it's not unusual that I will spend over an hour on a single bush, cataloging everything that's falling on there. And I may take, you know, a word of a hundred photo of that same bee. Um, and it's just a matter of selecting the angles of different angles of that bee because you never know what little um, hair on the leg, on the tibia of that bee that might be the, the what, you know, John Asher is going to be looking at or James is going to be looking at and say, oh, that's that species. Um, insects are really difficult to ID um, from photos, so we need to just get a lot of angles. And I just pick the best shots and I just put them in a naturalist in my observation. And go from there. It takes a lot of time. It is definitely time consuming, but it's it's also fun. I you know, I do I try allocations when I when I um go back to my computer. I just know usually where I was. Oftentimes, I will actually take, um, if I'm in a place where I've never been before and I'm not too familiar with the trails, I will actually take a photo of something with my phone. And I can actually, you know, my, I can drop that computer to my, to my, that photo, sorry, to my computer. And this will have a geolocation. So I just use the photo, I put it in the, in the observation, and a naturalist will say, oh, I know where that was, and put the location on there. And then I will do that for the later, but the location will stay there. So that's a little trick that I use sometimes to know exactly where I was. But I, a lot of the time, you're actually able to zoom in on the map. It's using uh, an entrance uses Google Map, so you can actually look. You know, I was in this campground. I parked here, and I can actually see the trail that goes here. Oh, I remember that big rock over there. You can actually see very detailed things on the map, and you can kind of orient yourself that way. Excellent questions. Do you have any more questions, Dan? Just a comment. Mark James says hello. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that thank you so much, Patricia. And we're ready to take our little nature walk. Um,